can come here and praise your name, Lord, for everything and with everything that we got, Lord. Would you bless the teaching this morning? Lord, and would you take down whatever barriers it is that we may have in our hearts or even on our mind, Lord, that may just take up space that would allow us not to hear what you have. So, thank you once again for this beautiful place that you have blessed us with, Lord. May you be glorified today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen and amen and good morning and welcome. So glad you're here. You can be seated. We're glad that you came. Those of you online, we're so glad that you're joining with us as well. Um, let me begin by first thanking all of you for your understanding, your grace, and your overwhelming love for my family and I during the month of May, which the Lord blessed in every possible way. It was actually the first time in 26 years that my family ever, we had never done anything like this before. It was the first time we ever as a family went anywhere together. When we flew to Cal, and that's on me by the way, <laughs> we flew to California for my second born son's college graduation. Now I don't share this to solicit sympathy or pity, rather to praise God and to thank you for allowing me as your pastor, my family, us to experience this amazing time together, which only God could have provided for and did. As many of you know, we actually celebrated two graduations. First my son, uh, and then my daughter, who graduated one year early as a junior from Kalaheo High School. So there were two graduations and two birthdays were included, no extra charge. <laughs> First one was for my wife, for whom we are most grateful to the many who've been praying concerning her battle with breast cancer, ongoing battle, I should say. Uh, we also celebrated a very special 26th birthday for our firstborn son, which this year in particular was very important for us to do as a family. So I'm glad to be back. <laughs> I'm a little exhausted, but yes, <laughs> thank you. I missed you. Did you miss me? <laughs> You're just saying that. I really missed the profound privilege that is mine, as I hope you know, to be your pastor and a teacher of God's Word, which is what we're going to do right now. This is our prophecy update. First service we dedicate to the teaching of the end times. We have for many years done these weekly Bible prophecy updates. And now second service has become the verse by verse teaching the sermon. As we're going through the Word of God, we're currently in the amazing book of Revelation. We're actually today going to do something just a little bit different and do an overview of sorts in a sermon I've titled, Jesus wrote a personal letter to me. You have to do that emphasis to me. And here's why. We're going to look at three reasons, the seven letters to the seven churches, which were written by Jesus via the Apostle John, were not just for the churches and Christians then, they were, but also as a personal letter to us now. So that'll be live stream for those of you online at 11.15 a.m. That's Hawaii time. And if you're watching by way of YouTube or Facebook, we'd encourage you to go directly to the website, jdfrog.org. And there you will find the uncensored and uninterrupted entirety of today's update, as only the first part is streamed on those platforms for censorship reasons. Let's get to it. I hope and pray that the update today 
will be an encouragement to you, especially to those who are hurting, of which I know there are many. You know, we continue to receive testimonies from people all over the world who share with us about their trials and struggles and how that these prophecy updates have become a lifeline for them as a reminder to them of the Lord's soon return. You know, we need to be reminded of that. Man, it's, it's, getting, it's getting bad, it's getting hard. And, but the Lord's coming. <laughs> the Lord's coming. And it just has this much needed effect of changing the whole complexion of whatever that trial is that you're going through, knowing that that trumpet could sound. And we're out of here. We're so out of here. You can tell I've been gone too long. With Well, during my time out of the pulpit, I was afforded the time just to be with Jesus. And it was time that I would not have otherwise had, which enabled me to catch my breath and kind of take a step back, so to speak. And in so doing, I was able to just get along with Jesus and kind of get out of the pressure cooker I put Mac and Leitu into. <laughs> the pressure cooker of preparing three to four teachings per week. Again, I'm not complaining. I'm just explaining that God in His grace, and He knew that I needed this. He granted me this time to just go to the altar and there find fresh fire on the altar of His call on my life. You know, I think about Jesus in the Gospels. You'll find that He left many needs unmet by the multitudes, and He would just go off to be alone with the Father. That's my story, and I'm sticking with it. So, well, God, as only He can during that time, and I'm so grateful to Him for it, opened the eyes of my understanding to specific details in a specific prophecy that fits precisely and exactly with where we're at right now in the world today. And it's for this reason that after inquiring of the Lord, I chose to title today's update. It's not just possible, it's now most probable. And by most probable, I mean now more than ever, the pre-tribulation rapture of the church draws closer as our redemption draws nearer with each passing day. The prophecy that God just opened my eyes up to in a fresh way is found in Romans 13, if you want to join me there. Beginning in verse 11, we'll go through to verse 14, which is actually the end of the chapter. We, I know we've covered this in many prior updates, but I want to draw your attention to these aforementioned details in this one specific passage in prophecy here in God's Word. Now the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Rome, and he says, verse 11, and do this. Here's what you need to do. Knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. And here's why. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Stop right there, Pastor. This was written some well nigh 2,000 years ago. And our salvation at that time was drawing nearer then. Here we are, fast forward almost 2,000 years later. 
Well, <laughs> it's 2,000 years nearer. And that's what he's trying to communicate to these Christians in the church there in Rome. The night is far spent, verse 12, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us, I want you to notice the, the contrast, cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us, verse 13, walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Okay. There are no less than seven words in just these four verses that I think we'd be grossly remiss were we not to have a better understanding of them. And the seven words are as follows in order. One, time. Two, now, which kind of connects with high time, now, time. Number three, works. Number four, darkness. Number five, interesting, properly. Number six, strife. And number seven, provision. So what follows is a quick explanation of the meaning of these seven words within the context that the Apostle Paul writes, inspired by the Holy Spirit. We'll start with the first one, time. In the original language of the Greek New Testament, time and high time is about time, carry with it the idea of first the right, fixed, appointed, and favorable time. Secondly, and actually more in depth in its meaning, it carries with it the idea of a period of time and season as the lateness of the hour draws ever so close, pointing to a time consisting of occasions for particular time set events. In other words, the events that have already been set. The time for them has already been appointed. It's already a set time. It's already in place. And it's now that time. The word now, which again, kind of is uh, connected to high time. It has the idea of a point of time prior to another point of time. <laughs> Duh. Wait with the implication of completion now. Say with me. It's now time, high time. It's that point of time, that time pointed to the appointed time. And that time is now. It's high time in the sense that the time has come to an end. And there's even more. It has the meaning of being awakened and ready for that which has been set in advance to happen, which ensues with an anticipation that results from one's hope and belief in what's now coming at this time of the end. Let's move on. You okay so far? You know, I could have taken every word, but I wouldn't do that to you. I, w I can, but I didn't. This is an interesting word in the original. It's the Greek word ergon from which we get our English word energy. Energy that displays itself in activity of any kind deed or action. But in this context, this energy is involving 
and directed mainly to that which is worldly, such that the energy is being used in a carn carnal way, carnality. What specifically? Oh, being accusatory, combative, and argumentative when one is in disagreement with another. Darkness. This is a firm grasp of the obvious, but there's something here I, I want to point out. It's that which represents a condition resulting from the partial or complete absence and or non-existence of any and all light sources, rendering it void of light and even life, as God is both light and life, and in Him there is no darkness at all. We're almost done properly. I chose this word for a reason. I think you'll see why in a moment. In the context with, within which Paul writes, it has this idea of appropriate behavior fitting of one who lives in a manner of decency, with honesty and integrity, interacting politely and honorably, especially towards those with whom they disagree. Strife, conflict, and fighting resulting from rivalry and discord, producing contention, dissension, division between two opposing parties with whom one possesses a strong intolerance towards. How am I doing? Provision. Thinking about, again within its context, and providing for something ahead of time, whether good or evil, which again in this context is the latter, as the context relates to one giving their undivided attention beforehand to think about ways and plans in advance to satisfy fleshly and worldly desires and pursuits. Now, that's seven. And it's with this deep dive into the meanings of these specific words in the original language that I would, if you don't mind, like to now expound and expand on with the following paraphrase. So here goes. You ready? Verse 11 through 14, Romans 13. For those who truly understand just how late the hour is for the pre-tribulation rapture, which can happen now, that it's the appointed time, high time, and desire to know what to do now, that the appointed time and hour has come, by virtue of how our salvation is nearer now than it has ever been before, must first and foremost be awake, be aware, and be ready for that which Scripture has prophesied in advance will absolutely happen. If one would but take heed, they will be filled with the joy and anticipation that results from our blessed hope and belief by faith in God's Word and God's promises. Example, you know how it is when you're excited about something? It's hard to remember as a kid, Christmas Eve. Did you sleep Christmas Eve? I didn't. Of course, my sister and I snuck downstairs to see what was in the wrapping paper. But you, you were so excited because you knew what was coming. So you were very aware. You were not sleeping. You were very awake. In fact, you got up super early, or at least feigned that you got up super early because you'd been up all night. And then you're, of course, waking up mom and dad. Hey, mom, dad, time to wake up. And 
Mom and dad are like, no, <laughs> I want to sleep in. No, but there's an excitement and anticipation. And this is what Paul is referring to. However, if instead of that, one continues to invest all their energy in works, deeds, activities that are focused on what the world is focused on, namely that of accusatory, combative, and argumentative disagreements, rather than behaving properly, treating those with whom they disagree decently and honestly, politely and honorably, with integrity, then their lives will be characterized by strife, conflict and fighting, resulting from a rivalry that's rife with discord and riddled with contention, dissension, division and opposition. This will ultimately lead to the possessing of a strong intolerance towards others, even worse. They will plunge themselves into the depths of darkness via their deeds of darkness by way of the absence of God, who is light and life. Now, in this state of godless darkness, they will then make provision for and think ahead of time about ways and plans to satisfy fleshly and worldly desires and pursuits. In other words, they're going to create an environment in their lives that's conducive to those worldly pursuits. They're going to give their attention to it. They're going to put their energy into it. But God, by the Holy Spirit, can empower anyone and everyone, no matter what they've done, or who they are, or who they think they are, to lay aside the drunken parties, lusts of the flesh, and worldly sexual immorality, replacing it with the, notice the contrast again, putting on, lay aside, put off that, take that off, get that off, get that out. Put this on instead. What am I to put on instead? The spiritual armor of light. Why? For both the protection from and victory over the devil, the flesh, and the world's, listen, ever growing and powerful pull away from Jesus in this, the last hour. It is the likes of which I personally have never seen before in my life. The powerful pull on the part of the world. Let me say it like this, everything, and I mean everything, is geared towards pulling you away from Jesus. In fact, that is a litmus test that has served me well over the years. And it's in the broad sense across the board in every arena of life. Here's the test. Ask yourself this question. Does that form of entertainment does that hobby, does that relationship, does that you fill in the blank, does that draw me nearer to Jesus, or does that compete and take me away from Jesus? That's the litmus test. And this is what Paul is saying here. There's no more time. <laughs> We're out of time. Playtime's over. There's no more time to play church. There's no more time to play Christianity. It's high time to awake out of your spiritual slumber. You're sleepy. Now this is where it gets really interesting, and you're just going to have to indulge me on this. And I'm going to give you some homework, and you're going to be tested on this next week. So listen very carefully. This is ironic too, because when I taught through Romans, for some inexplicable reason, Romans 13 did not get recorded. We get emailed all the time. How come, where did Romans 13 go? 
And all we can say is, I'm just going to have to reteach it now, because there's just no recording for it. So this is, this is part one. Uh, but do you realize what Romans 13 is about? What if I told you that right before Paul writes this, he first writes, with a sanctified strength, I might add, how Christians should relate to government authorities, elected officials. Wait, it gets better. So that's how he starts off Romans 13. And then after he gets done talking about the Christian's relationship to the government, he then goes on to talk ironically and curiously about how Christians should relate to others by owing no one no thing with the exception of loving one another. Let me see if I can connect a couple of dots here. Some of you already have. We, we just got done reading just verses 11 through 14, but it's in the context of the Christian's relationship with the government and the Christian's relationship with their fellow Christians. And then he ends it and ties a bow on it by saying, here's what you need to do about it, knowing that our salvation draws nearer. It changes everything. This is a game changer. So again, as I'm spending time with the Lord, I'm just, ah, just drinking deeply from the cup of His Word and the bread of life. And it just hit me. You know how when the light bulb goes off? <laughs> it happens to me a lot which means the lights are out a lot. But the light bulb just started going on. It's like, wait a minute. That's us now. Now well, think about it. It's an election year. Romans 13, the first part. Social media right now, I'm not even going it on any social media platform. I want to keep my sanctification and lower my blood pressure. Because you go on social media right now, and we're talking Christians, by the way. That's the se second part of Romans 13. So what's the answer? The last part of Romans 13 that I just went to great detail to explain. There's no time to get into arguments about right or left, conservative or liberal, Republican or Democrat, red or blue. I'm fond of yellow myself. What, what, are, you, what are you talking about, Pastor? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> you asked, right? The reason is because this is at the top of the list. Uh-oh. You made another list, didn't you? Yes, I did. And I want to briefly go over it, if you don't mind. And the reason is it's high time. It's about time that we as Christians, myself included, realize that it is now time to wake up and rise out of our spiritual slumber. You know what's sad? Many have been lullabied into a deep spiritual sleep concerning the things of God, yet conversely they instead are wide awake to the things of the world. The things of God, things of the world, hey, what's season two? When's that coming out? 
May I just humbly ask that we consider this list related to how the things of this world have in large measure distracted at best and diverted at worst our time and energy away from Jesus at a time that is most unforgiving of doing so. For lack of a better title for this list, I'm calling it the instead of list. Do you like that? It's weird. The instead of list? Yeah. The instead of list. Such that many lay aside Jesus and put on the world, instead of laying aside the world and putting on Jesus. Please hear my heart. I'm not trying to beat up on anybody. If anything, I'm beating up on myself. I'm just as prone to this as anyone is. And it's so diabolical, and I cho chose that word deliberately, because in the, in the Bible, the word diabolos is the word devil. Diabolical. It's backwards. Evil, E-V-I-L, is live backwards. Lived is devil backwards. It's so diabolical. It diabolically opposes the Word of God and the God of the Word specific to this specific prophecy here in Romans chapter 13. So that's my introduction to the list. I'll go through it quickly. You ready? Here's the list. Number one. Instead of getting Jesus to people and people to Jesus, professing Christians are getting the vote to the people and people to vote. Wait a minute, Pastor, what are you talking about? Um, it's all political theater. It's all geared to get you away from Jesus and get you fighting with other people about Jesus. I'm getting ahead of myself. So now all of a sudden we've inferred, implied, really the message that we're sending when we do that, when we're so focused on and invest tremendous amounts of energy on an election year, that is time and energy that could have been put on or into bringing people to Jesus. I've made the comment before, I'll say the same thing again in a different way. But I just wonder, what would our world, what would this nation, we could just say this nation, what would it look like if Christians, instead of put all that time and all that energy into sharing the gospel and prayer and time in God's Word. What would change? I promise you on the authority of God's Word, everything would change. You better keep moving. I, uh, that was just one. Number two. See, I already got ahead of myself. But instead of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, professing Christians have diverted time and energy to arguing with each other about Jesus Christ. Can you imagine how that grieves the Lord? How that grieves the heart of God when on social media you got Christian battling Christian, saying sometimes the most vile of things. <laughs> We're trying to win the world to Christ. And they're reading the letter of our lives, like Paul said, we're a living epistle. They're reading the letter of our lives. They're reading every single post we post. And, and they're looking at our profile going, wait a minute, that dude that invited me to his church last week, and he's posting that? That was kind of convicting a little bit, maybe, for <laughs> number three. It's a biggie. They're all biggies, but instead of having time to pursue righteousness, professing Christians seemingly have plenty of time to pursue unrighteousness. It's been said that if it's important enough, you'll make time for it. 
You know, we say, well, I, I, just, I just don't have time. Oh, no, you have time. Well, I don't do it because I just don't have time. No, you don't do it because it's not a priority. Because if it were a priority, you would carve out the necessary time to do that which you deemed important and prioritized. Now, I'm, I'm very convicted on that one. <laughs> Number four, instead of possessing energy to wake up from sleepy Christianity, professing Christians possess the energy for anything and everything else but Christianity. And this kind of ties into number five. Instead of desiring to sit under the teaching of God's Word for even one hour, which by the way, you can't even really find that. Here you'll find, you get your money's worth here. But I mean, no, we, the church is an hour. Well, we can't keep, we got to keep it fast moving. We can't, we can't hold their attention for an hour. You are absolutely correct, sir. It's not your job to anyway. It's the Holy Spirit. And I thank God for that. That it's not on me to, to get your attention and hold your attention. Come out here with skinny jeans and a latte and keep it moving and hip and cool and relevant. I'm sorry about that picture, but that, that ship sailed a long time ago. In fact, so long the dock has sunk that that ship was on. So instead of, and I'm, I'm saying professing Christians for a reason, I hope you know why, but instead of desiring to sit under the teaching of God's Word for even one hour, professing Christians will be entertained and or engaged in some worldly pursuit for hours upon hours. Number six, instead of knowing and understanding that now is the time, professing Christians somehow think there's no hurry and no worry. We got plenty of time. Let me try that one again. That wasn't very good. <laughs> plenty of time. Was that better? Plenty of time. Plenty. I'm going to just stop trying. And number seven, lastly, instead of discerning and understanding the hour in which we're living, professing Christians by the lie of the devil's narrative about the dark and fallen world in which we're living. Did you catch that? Paul starts out right out of the chute in verse 11. Uh, you need to do this because you know what time it is. That's why you need to do this. Discern and understand the hour in which we are living. You know, when you're asleep, you're not aware of your surroundings, especially if you're a deep sleeper. If you're a deep sleeper, you better thank God every morning when you wake up that you get good deep sleep. There's a verse in the Bible that said, God loves those, to those whom God loves, He grants them sleep. To which I respond, I don't think God loves me very much, because I don't get very much sleep. Deep sleep is a gift from God. That's the way you clean your mind. In fact, all the waste, the cleaning crew comes in at night. The, the, the rest of your system, except the brain, the, the way it gets rid of the waste, but not the brain. The brain needs sleep. You know your brain's working harder when you're sleeping than when you're awake? <laughs> Some of you are going, well, with that person I can see it. <laughs> Don't think of it like that. The brain brings in the cleaning crew at night, and it cleans up and gets everything ready for the morning. That's why when you wake up, you feel refreshed and clean and renewed. If you get a good restorative night's sleep, because all that good, that's why you have those weird dreams of being chased by a marshmallow <laughs> to school in your pajamas. It's recurring. And you wake up in your pajamas, and the marshmallow is your pillow. 
that's your, God has granted you the ability with those weird dreams to just kind of reboot your brain from the stuff of the day, the stresses of life. I didn't mean to get into that. Now, I hope you know that this list is in no way exhaustive, and that really I only intended to paint the prophetic canvas with a broad brush. However, it is incumbent upon me to get into more detail on this seventh one, on the instead of list. And I want to take the remainder of our time together today to do so. But we'll go ahead at this time in order to do that and end the live stream on YouTube and Facebook.